everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Wartuli, and I am the Assistant Director of Programs at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I want to welcome you to our penultimate uh, public program of the year. Tonight, we'll be hearing from John G. Turner on his book, They Knew They Were Pilgrims, Plymouth Colony and the Contest for American Liberty. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, I want to give those of you uh, who may be joining us for the first time a brief introduction to the Massachusetts Historical Society. So the MHS uh, was founded in 1791, which makes us the oldest historical society in the nation. Today, we are a major historical archive, a research library, and a resource for American history, life, and culture. In our uh, collection, we hold millions of rare and unique documents, artifacts, and national treasures, including the papers of three uh, US presidents, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and the personal papers of Thomas Jefferson. So as we are uh, winding down this year um, and what a year it has been, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you who have attended our virtual programs um, over the course of the last nine months. Uh, so whether you have regularly tuned into our virtual programs um, or if this is your very first interaction with the Massachusetts Historical Society, we want to express our gratitude for your engagement during this strange and stressful time. With all of the challenges that the pandemic has brought, we at the MHS are very grateful that uh, we can not only maintain, but also grow our community of history lovers. So thank you for coming on this journey with us. Um, so among all the other things that make the year 2021 for the books is the fact that it is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Voyage and the founding of Plymouth Colony. The pandemic has scuttled a lot of uh, statewide and national activities that, that were to take place to mark this anniversary. Um, but we wanted to put together something of a small um, or loose uh, program series looking at this important history. Tonight's program will be the last in a series of talks we've had. Um, the previous programs being a virtual tour of Plymouth, uh, a look at the music of the Pilgrims and a look at the life and times of Plymouth Colony First Lady Penel Penelope Winslow. Uh, so these last two programs are currently posted on our YouTube channel, as are many of the other virtual programs that we've run in the past nine months. So if you've missed them and want to check them out, they are there for you. So tonight we'll be hearing from John Turner. Uh, professor Turner is a professor of religious studies at George Mason University and writes, speaks, and teaches about the place of religion in American history and culture. He earned his Master in Divinity at the Louisville, Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary and his PhD in American History from Notre Dame. Uh, his earlier books look at the history of Mormonism and include Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet, in 2020, uh, published in uh, 2012, and The Mormon Jesus, a biography published in 2016, both by Harvard University Press. Tonight, he'll be uh, presenting his book, uh, They Knew They Were Pilgrims, Plymouth Colony and the Contest for American Liberty. This history attempts to interrupt the two prevailing stories about the pilgrims, that of the uh, bra brave refugees uh, searching for religious liberty in the new land and that of oppressors who betrayed their Native American allies, stole their land and went to war. As Professor Turner will demonstrate, there is a more complicated history than these two narratives suggest. Um, we should have plenty of time for questions, so please submit them to the Q&A um, as they come to you, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So, Professor Turner, thank you for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Uh, I'm so pleased to, to participate in this program. The Massachusetts Historical Society is one of my very favorite places in the world to do research. Uh, the collections are so vast and rich. Uh, the staff are so professional, courteous, and knowledgeable. And I always have found that it's hard not to at least feel smarter when surrounded by the portraits on the walls of the reading room. It gives you something to try to aspire to and live up to. Uh, for a, a historian, it's rather like heaven on earth. Uh, this evening, I'm going to begin with a story and then try to pose some big questions about the legacy of Plymouth Colony. Uh, the story is from the town of Swansea uh, in Plymouth uh, Colony. And the main action takes place in June of 1675 as English soldiers and townspeople huddled in the house of the Reverend uh, John Miles. Back in the 1650s, 
Miles had formed a network of Baptist congregations and lay groups in Southern Wales. Uh, he rejoiced that since the enjoyment of our precious liberty to hold forth the word of God, many thousands are come to the profession of the gospel. After the restoration of the English monarchy, Miles no longer had that liberty, so he wisely moved to New England, first to the Bay Colony, and then to the Plymouth Colony town of Rehoboth. Miles was a powerful preacher, but not everyone was glad that he was there. Thomas Prince, the colony's governor, soon complained about a majority vote gathered together by some discontents in a promiscuous assembly of servants who chose Miles to become the town's minister. Eventually, Governor Prince and Reverend Miles worked out a compromise. Miles and his fellow opponents of infant baptism would establish a new town, which became Swansea. The new settlements further encroached on native lands and were not far from Mount Hope, where the Poconokets and their sachem Medicom or Philip lived. So fast forward from there about a decade. The skirmishes that became King Philip's war began near John Miles's house. On June 23rd of 1675, a young English settler shot and killed a native man. The next day, six English settlers were killed in retaliation. That night, natives attacked Miles's house, which townspeople and soldiers used as a garrison. Several men uh, were shot. Plymouth Captain James Cudworth reported that for one wounded man, there was no hope of life. He identified the victim only as Mr. Miles, his Negro. Thus, one of the very first English casualties in this war was an enslaved African. The case of John Miles points to some paradoxes about liberty in 17th century New England. In most respects, Miles and Plymouth Colony's other religious leaders articulated very similar versions of Christian liberty. They just differed on the matter of infant baptism. Did the people of a town have the liberty to employ as their minister someone who would not baptize all of the town's children. Uh, while they disagreed about baptism, no one took issue with the fact that John Miles held other human beings in bondage. Miles was one of Plymouth Colony's foremost slaveholders. According to probate documents, he owned at least five African slaves at the time of his 1683 death. Listed right after his horses and his pigs, they were his most valuable possession. So let's move from John Miles to some big questions. When and where and how uh, does the story of the United States begin? There are some very obvious possibilities, such as 1776 in Philadelphia, or 11 years later in 1787. Recently though, there's been a lot of sound and fury uh, surrounding the dates 1619 and 1620. The 1619 project of the New York Times contends, as one Times writer put it, that African slavery is the country's original sin but it is more than that. It is the country's very origin. And as most of you know, there's also been a lot of pushback against the 1619 project from eminent uh, historians such as Gordon Wood to politicians uh, such as President Trump. Our outgoing president established a 1776 commission in response but there are also attempts to revive the importance of 1620 
the Mayflower Crossing, and the establishment of Plymouth Colony. The National Association of Scholars and the media outlet The Federalist both established 1620 projects, setting up a clash between Jamestown, slavery, and 1619 on the one hand, and Plymouth Colony, Liberty, and 1620 on the other. This is a false and unnecessary choice. For starters, 1619 marks the advent in Virginia of both African slavery and of representative uh, democracy. As Edmund Morgan argued many decades ago, American slavery and American freedom developed in tandem. The same was true in Plymouth Colony, and that's what I want to talk about this evening. The colony established by the Mayflower passengers remains important for understanding the development of liberty in America. But the Pilgrim Colony and its English settlers also participated in the enslavement and exchange of human beings, both native and African. In fact, it's impossible to understand English ideas about liberty without reckoning with liberty's stark opposite. So first some thoughts about liberty in Plymouth Colony, then about slavery. For the separatists among the Mayflower passengers, liberty first and foremost meant Christian liberty. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, wrote the apostle Paul, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. For the separatist pilgrims, Christian liberty meant the obligation of true Christians to withdraw from the Church of England and to form covenanted congregations. They would then elect their officers, admit new members, and exercise church discipline. John Robinson, minister to many of the Mayflower passengers in the Dutch city of Leiden, conceded that his congregation's government was, after a sort, popular and democratic. There was a basic congruence between that separatist ecclesiology and the agreement signed aboard the Mayflower, which eventually became known as the Mayflower Compact. The authors of the agreement referred to it as a covenant which in this case created a body politic. One covenant fashioned a congregation of the body of Christ, the other a body politic. The Mayflower Compact was a makeshift agreement, necessary in part because the ship had missed its intended destination and because the passengers had no patent to establish a colony and government in New England. There was a brewing mutiny and the risk that some passengers might simply go their own way, leading to the colony's uh, early collapse. The language of the compact is very terse and mostly boilerplate, both in its expression of loyalty to King James and in its talk about the glory of God. In the 19th century and in some quarters down to the present, straight lines have been drawn from the cabin of the Mayflower to the Constitutional Convention. This really is fantasy. The framers of the US Constitution took their inspiration from John Locke, not from John Robinson. Still, the principle at the heart of the Mayflower Compact is clear and important. The compact affirmed that those who belonged to the body politic held the authority to enact, constitute, and frame just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices. In other words, the legitimacy of laws and political offices rested on the consent of the people. Sixteen years later, 
Plymouth Colony's political leaders read the compact aloud when they met to revise their laws. They affirmed that laws and taxes could only be imposed on them by consent, according to the free liberties of the state and kingdom of England. The principles of consent and equity might be traced back to Magna Carta, but the body politic established by the Mayflower Compact was shockingly broad. Nearly all of the adult male passengers signed it, in some cases servants alongside their masters. Perhaps they were forced to sign it or coerced to sign it, we don't really know. But there certainly were blunter ways of tamping down mutinies than by giving unruly men the right to vote. And in a visible demonstration of the compact's principle, right after signing it, the members of this body politic elected a governor for the next year. They then held annual elections in all but one of the next 70 years. By way of contrast, the first representative assembly in Virginia met in 1619, but company leaders back in London still appointed a governor and council. From the start, the Plymouth colony votes that mattered were cast in person, not on the other side of the ocean. The fuller story of liberty in Plymouth Colony has to extend far beyond the separatists on the Mayflower and their compact. Baptists, Quakers, and Presbyterians, and others brought their own understandings of Christian liberty to New England. And the body politic by no means remained as inclusive as it was at first. By the end of the Plymouth Colony time period, only a small minority of adult men were free men with the right to participate in colony-wide elections and lawmaking assemblies. Church membership, unlike in the Bay Colony, was not a requirement for this right, but religious dissenters sometimes were stripped of their political liberties. As David Hall has also demonstrated, uh, town governance and other forms of political participation mattered as well. Ply Plymouth Colony should still occupy a significant place in a discussion of early American liberty in those colonies that became the United States. It's just not a simple story, but rather a matter of ongoing debate and contest. And a story that cannot be told properly without full consideration of slavery within the colony founded by the pilgrims. Until recently, one might have been forgiven for thinking that slavery was not an important part of Plymouth Colony's history, at least outside of the particular circumstances of King Philip's war. Edward Randolph, an English official who made himself notorious in New England in the 1670s and 1680s, visited Plymouth and reported back to England uh, that in that colony, there were no slaves, only hired servants. Historians until recently largely echoed that view. John DeMoss, who wrote a marvelous portrait of family life in Plymouth, observed that Negro and Indian servants were very uncommon until after the old colony period. This view is in accord with the sense that Plymouth Colony was an isolated, impoverished backwater. Samuel, Samuel Elliot Morrison, for example, uh, described it as one of the smallest, weakest, and least important of the English colonies. One would hardly expect to find slaves in a place removed from the larger intellectual and economic networks of the transatlantic world. Scholarship on the history of slavery in New England has advanced a great deal in recent years. I am thinking of landmark studies by historians such as Margaret Newell, Wendy Warren, Lynn Fisher, and others. As Warren puts it, African slavery 
was not confined to port towns such as Boston and Newport, but extended into the New England interior. I would add all the way into Plymouth Colonies townships. What does it mean for someone to be enslaved? Andre Resendez suggests that while a simple definition of slavery is elusive, enslavement generally involves the forced removal of the victims from one place to another, inability to leave the workforce, violence or threat of violence to compel them to work and nominal or no pay. So who in early New England uh, would fit that definition. We, we might look at a number of diverse examples. The English servants who were taken to the Marymount outpost on the rim of Massachusetts Bay in 1624, an Irish man killed during King Philip's War who was part of an English settler's estate, perhaps even an English settler sentenced to servitude because of vagrancy indolence and Sabbath breaking. These individuals were certainly not uh, free laborers. But most individuals whom we would regard as slaves were native or African. Let's take those uh, one at a time. Native slavery played an important role in the colony's founding. In the decades prior to the Mayflower, a number of English ship captains had kidnapped natives along the New England coast, taking them to England to groom as guides and interpreters. In 1614, one of those ship captains seized 27 natives, 20 from Patuxet, the site of the Plymouth settlement, the future Plymouth settlement, and seven from among the Nausets on the Cape. African slavery is certainly not the only American original sin. That ship captain sold them for slaves for 20 pounds each in Spain. In all likelihood, uh, most died during the crossing or soon afterwards. Catholic priests apparently rescued some and one of those rescued, Tisquantum or Squanto, somehow made his way to England and eventually secured passage home. Squanto became invaluable uh, to the pilgrims uh, until his late 1622 death. Relations between the pilgrims and native communities were from the start far more rocky than the American Thanksgiving myth has suggested. In 1623, the pilgrims launched a preemptive strike against natives on Massachusetts Bay, treacherously murdering several and bringing the head of one enemy back to Plymouth. As far as we know, at this early date, the pilgrims did not consider taking natives captive and enslaving them. I don't think the pilgrims would have wanted any substantial number of natives living and working in their settlement or near it. They preferred to keep all but a few trusted uh, natives at a safe distance. The enslavement of captives, however, was a well-established biblical and legal principle. He that was taken in battle, reasoned Edmund Coke, should remain bond to his taker forever. This principle was generally not applied in intra-European wars, but New England settlers put it into practice beginning with the 1630s Pequot War. A few of those Pequot War captives ended up in Plymouth Colony. In 1648, former Mayflower passenger Susanna Winslow sold a native boy named Hope to a ship captain bound for Barbados. Hope was likely a Pequot captive. He had worked alongside a number of English servants on the Winslow's extensive estate in Marshfield. 
The bill of sale, uh, when Susanna Winslow sold Hope, specified a 10-year period of service. But it's fair to say that in their disposal of him to the Caribbean, the Winslows treated Hope like a slave, not like an English servant. Unless one of their English servants had committed a horrid crime, it would have been unfathomable for the Winslows to sell his labor to a Caribbean planter. Yet they sold Hope. As English settlements expanded, Indians and English more frequently lived in relative proximity, and colonial governments sought to bring native communities under their jurisdiction. Settlers became more eager to exploit an inexpensive source of labor. As traditional means of subsistence disappeared, more native men, women, and children worked in English households. Oftentimes, those arrangements were not voluntary. Plymouth's general court passed a law that Indians, especially young men as run in debt to any English, shall be made to work it out at reasonable rates. Even harsher punishments were a possibility. In 1674, Plymouth's magistrates sentenced a native man named Hoken to be sold or sent to Barbados. Hoken had been jailed for theft. He escaped, uh, stole a horse and eluded capture for a while, but he was eventually found and sold. For the development of native slavery in Plymouth Colony, King Philip's War was the great turning point. The seizure and sale of captives cleared lands of native inhabitants, raised funds for colonial governments, and provided English households with an inexpensive source of unpaid labor. These developments have been well documented by many historians, but it remains stunning that hundreds of natives were exported during the war to places as far away as Tangiers and possibly Madagascar. Hundreds more remained in Plymouth Colony, but were, were reduced to various terms of servitude. One of those captives, a little boy named Jether, temporarily ended up in the household of Plymouth's minister, John Cotton Jr., who groomed him for service to his brother-in-law, Boston's Increase Mather. Cotton at one point lamented that Jether was meanly clad, blaming that situation on the fact that his wife Joanna was away visiting relatives. John Cotton did not take it upon himself to provide better clothing for this traumatized child. Before undertaking the research for this book, I knew about the enslavement of natives in the wake of the war. But I was surprised at the sheer ubiquity of native servitude in the closing years of the Plymouth Colony period. Were these individuals servants or slaves? A hodgepodge of colonial statutes, indentures, and bills of sale created considerable ambiguity, as did the fact that later in the century, other native captives came to New England settlements from places like Maine, Carolina, and Florida. Debt and poverty forced many other natives, especially children, to toil in English households. The result was that many natives labored in a murky and ill-defined capacity. The English uh, nearly always referred to them as servants, uh, but regardless of the term that we choose to employ, they were in bondage. What about African slaves? At the same time that native servitude became widespread, the number of African slaves in the colony also grew. After King Philip's War, much of this increase was due to settlers from Rhode Island bringing slaves onto newly conquered lands 
then in the western part of Plymouth's, Plymouth's jurisdiction. But slavery grew in other townships as well. For example, Situate's Walter Briggs, who lost his Irish man during the war, owned at least two African slaves. In 1673, Briggs purchased one of them, a girl named Margaret, from a Boston mariner. The deed of sale clarified that Margaret would serve Briggs and his heirs during her natural life. As it turned out, over the next 20 years, Margaret was owned by five different members of the Briggs family. In his 1693 will, Cornelius Briggs, who lived in Barnstable on the Cape, specified that she would receive her liberty after another 13 years of service. After his death the next year, she was sold to another situate settler for 11 pounds. It's unclear whether she ever gained her freedom. Within Plymouth Colony, there were a few larger slaveholders, such as one time Leiden separatist and uh, New York City mayor, Thomas Willett, who owned eight slaves at the time of his death, and the Baptist minister, John Miles, uh, whom I mentioned at the outset. Certainly, the overall number of African slaves in Plymouth Colony was not huge. Wendy Warren estimates, estimates that there were 1,500 enslaved Africans across New England as a whole by the end of the 17th century. But nevertheless, one can find many instances, many local instances of African slavery in Situate, Barnstable, Bristol, Little Compton. In other words, across the colony. A more granular portrait of African slavery within Plymouth Colony awaits a comprehensive examination of probate documents. I only learned about John Miles uh, owning uh, five or more slaves uh, from looking at his, uh, the inventory of his estate. Certainly only a small percentage of families owned African slaves. They were far more expensive than various forms of native labor. Plymouth's general court never passed any laws codifying or regulating African slavery. English settlers, though, were accustomed to seeing Africans in bondage. They understood that it was a lifelong and inheritable condition unless an owner chose to manumit his or her slaves. In 1820, the Boston lawyer, Daniel Webster, delivered a nearly two hour oration on the bicentennial of the Pilgrim settlement at Plymouth. In parts of his address, he spoke in the first person as if he himself uh, had been among uh, the Mayflower passengers. From the simplicity of our social union, Webster maintained, there shall arise wise and politic constitutions of government full of the liberty which we ourselves bring and breathe. Webster contrasted the freehold liberty established by the pilgrims with the evil of slavery that their descendants had yet to eradicate. Let us pledge ourselves here, he demanded, upon the rock of Plymouth to extirpate and destroy it. For Webster and for many of his white New England contemporaries, the pilgrims were the progenitors of American republicanism, democracy, and freedom. Uh, with them in mind, uh, Americans should pledge themselves to further advance liberty. For William Apis, an early 19th century Methodist minister of mixed Pequot ancestry. The idea that the pilgrims came to New England for liberty was a cruel misunderstanding of the past. Apis arraigned the pilgrims for their hypocrisy. Paradigmatic for him was their most horrid act, taking Philip's son, the son of Medicom, about 10 years of age and selling him. 
Apis speculated that all of my countrymen would have been enslaved if they had tamely submitted. I do not hesitate to say, he wrote, that through the prayers, preaching, and examples of those pretended pious has been the foundation of all of the slavery and degradation in the American colonies toward colored people. The pilgrims were the progenitors of slavery, not freedom, for William Apis. There's no question that 17th century meanings of liberty were of central importance to not only the pilgrims, but to the English settlers who followed them. Separatists, other Puritans, Baptists, and Quakers all prized Christian liberty. The Mayflower Compact remained a foundational principle for the colony's leaders and lawmakers. Yet even as Plymouth's English settlers stood fast in their liberty, they placed others under the yoke of bondage. In Plymouth Colony, as in Virginia, as in every part of what became the United States, American slavery and American liberty developed in tandem alongside each other. Thank you. Look forward to some questions and discussion. Thanks, John. Um, we do have some questions waiting in the wings. Um, first, uh, Dave asks, um, where did Jethro and the other African enslaved people that Reverend John Miles owned come from? Um, were they from Virginia or Barbados? Were they sold in Boston? Were they traded uh, for native enslaved people? Sure. Um, it's a great question. There's a variety of answers. Um, some definitely came via uh, Rhode Island and also from New Amsterdam. So Thomas Willett, who was really the foremost slaveholder in Plymouth Colony prior to King Philip's War, he did a lot of business in New Amsterdam and I suspect um, that he either obtained his slaves from there or from um, Rhode Island communities. Um, one, of, one of his slaves ended up being taken uh, captive by natives during the war, um, and he was uh, more or less granted his freedom afterward because of it. Um, other slaves were purchased from Boston, as in the Situate example uh, that I mentioned. Uh, there was one uh, slave ship uh, in the early 1680s that actually um, was at least planned to be diverted to, to Plymouth Colony uh, coming from the Caribbean. Uh, but for the most part, um, Plymouth didn't have a port that received uh, any large shipments of slaves itself. Thank you, Dave. That was a good question. Um, and I was just curious if um, there were any prominent settler voices that um, argued against um, the morality or argued for the immorality of um, colonial slavery and if they got any traction? So that's, that's a, also a great question. So here I think it's useful to make a distinction between native slavery and African slavery. Um, there were some voices raised against the enslavement of uh, native captives, uh, both for pragmatic reasons you know, this would make it more difficult to defeat the natives because they wouldn't want to surrender for fear that they might be exported uh, to the Caribbean, uh, but also for reasons of Christian morality. Uh, John Elliott, uh, the Bay Colony minister, was a, a famous critic of the enslavement of captives. Uh, there was a minister in Plymouth Colony, I'm forgetting um, which town, uh, Thomas Willie who made arguments very similar uh, to those of John Eliot. Um, and there was clearly debate about um, how to regulate uh, native servitude in the years after the war. There were a series of laws passed uh, to try to clarify that children in particular uh, would not be slaves for life, but would only serve up to the age of 25. Um, so we don't really have a record of the debates, but the fact that you have a series of laws passed 
uh, clearly it was a topic of conversation and concern. I'm not aware of any expression uh, of scruples about African slavery uh, with, by settlers uh, within Plymouth Colony, uh, you know, through the end of the colony's um, self-government in 1691. Um, more generally, colonial expressions of opposition to the enslavement of Africans was really rare. Samuel Sewell, a uh, Boston uh, merchant, is the most prominent example. He actually ended up in a very public conflict with a former resident of Plymouth Colony um, who still owned uh, slaves in Bristol uh, around the year 1700. Uh, but Sewell's was a very rare voice. Um, I think for the most part, throughout the 17th century, uh, English settlers took for granted the morality of retaining African slaves who had been previously made slaves elsewhere. There's some great books uh, on the subject. I think it's sort of a, you know, a, a matter of course that when sl African slaves arrived, you know, they, it was, okay to purchase and retain them. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine asks, uh, how about marriage under coverture as a model for colonial slave slavery? Marriage under coverture as a model for colonial slavery. Uh, does the questioner want to provide a little bit more guidance on that? Catherine, do you have any uh, any additional thoughts? Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Catherine Auger. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. And this was a great program. Um, I'm kind of interested, I, and I threw out the question because um, in uh, this the wonderful book that you mentioned, um, um, American Slavery, American Freedom, Ed Morgan's book, um, he explores all of these models for subordination and labor. And he's trying to get at what, how did, how did we being a, or Americans make that jump to this model of slavery that was really extreme? It was lifelong, it was inheritable, it was immutable, it was gonna be ratified by nature. Um, some of the first laws in the new colony, I'm thinking of Virginia as well, were regulating uh, marriage and reproduction and they were really strict. And he puzzles through this whole book through it. But at some point he mentions just casually that shortly after the 1619 moment, the first people, some of the first people sold on the shores were white women. Mm. So they're white women brought up from England, their indentures were sold. Um, they are now going to fit that definition of slavery that you're talking about, right? Because mm. under coverture, they have no legal um, existence. They can't make a contract, they can't, you know, vote, uh, but they also don't own anything their husbands have control over their bodies, right? So they, they can be sent out to work and the husband gets the money for it. Um, the fruits of their bodies, their, their children, they have no ownership in their children. Uh, and at least legally, there's uh, guaranteed sexual access. So I, I think that, um, and Morgan missed a moment because I think the closest model to chattel slavery that the English knew weren't had nothing to do with really Irish poor people, it had to do with the women in their homes. Um, well, that's a great, that's a great question. I appreciate the thought. Um, I'll have to pull Morgan's book off the shelf again and, and review what he says about it. I think, you know, I, I was very influenced by a book by Michael uh, Glasgow, I don't know, came out five or 10 years ago, which talked about simply how ubiquitous slavery was uh, in the world in the 16th, 17th centuries, that we might find it shocking that English um, settlers at Point Comfort in Virginia would think that they could purchase these human beings. But I think in their imaginations, at least, English were quite well acquainted with slavery. Um, you know, wherever English traders, for the most part, went around the world, uh, they would see slaves, whether that was going to Russia or whether that was going to Java. The English themselves might become slaves in the Mediterranean. Um, 
you know, so I, I don't think actually there was much of a need uh, even, even for the model uh, that you mentioned, although that's a very interesting parallel as well. And there are also other servants who are rounded up and taken to Virginia or New England uh, in the 1620s. Um, but, I, you know, I think it points to a larger reality, which is something that for us seems shockingly immoral was not at all that surprising uh, to people living in the 17th century. And I think that's a little bit difficult for us to, to reckon with. Yeah, and I agree. And I think part of the reason it's so easy for them to see slavery was they were quite accustomed to a model where certain human beings had almost absolute control over the bodies of others. Yeah. And that was right at home. Right. But I'll I mean, pop off now and let somebody else have a chance of conversation. Sure. John, thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. That's a great point. Um, so we have a question from Anthony who writes, uh, do you feel that too many historians and others are assessing past history by using current standards and values? Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I can, I could either say yes or no, uh, depending on how, how I'm feeling at the moment. I mean, I think that's, it, it's almost impossible, you know, you know, historians aren't in some vacuum from the present. Uh, able to entirely divorce themselves from present concerns and, and present day uh, moralities. I don't think that should be their foremost objective. Um, I think, you know, it's most useful for us as, his, as historians um, to not stand in moral judgment on peoples of the past, but to try to help all of us broaden our horizons by realizing that people in different times and places did simply see the world in different ways. And sometimes those ways are you know, totally um, diverge from our own sense of uh, morality. But I think in a way that that's also a useful reminder for us. It should humble us because we know that in a hundred years or 200 years, people are gonna look back on the early 21st century and think that we were woefully lacking in terms of a moral compass in all sorts of ways that we might not even recognize. Um, so I think a little, a little dose of humility is, is always good. And I think it's one of the foremost virtues of uh, studying the past. Mm. Great. Um, Daniel writes, uh, your presentation pointed to two very different definitions of liberty the 17th century notion of Christian liberty and the 18th century enlightenment notion of individual liberty. At the same time, your focus on Plymouth and Plymouth's enslavement of Africans and natives is on the former period. First, were these connected? And second, when do you see Plymouth's embrace of enslavement changing? And was that connected in any way to their changing ideas of Christianity? Well, that's a great question. So, I mean, I think in terms of the development of opposition to slavery, I really see that coming about. You know, um, there's a great book by uh, Catherine Breckus called Sarah Osborne's World that traces New England evangelical opposition to uh, slavery that emerges in the six, you know, 1760s, 1770s as sort of a you know humanitarian. Um, part of the, you know, American Enlightenment. Um, so I, I would I would put it, you know, in, in that later time period. Um, the question also suggested, you know, developments of you know Christian and political liberties in other ways. I honestly haven't thought of, about that um, intimately beyond the Plymouth Colony uh, time period. I do think I, I like the fact that the question, you know, draws a distinction between sort of individual liberty and the sorts of liberty that mattered most to 17th century settlers. Um, you know, certainly individual liberty of conscience might matter. Uh, but for the, for the most part, that was not the foremost concern of um, certainly the Mayflower passengers, not the foremost concern of many of many later settlers as well. Um, I'm wondering, uh, so your book, it talks about the stories of sort of these 
great men, well-known to us, well-known well -known figures, as well as lesser known or completely obscure figures. And I'm wondering, um, uh, so among the lesser known figures that uh, bubbled up during your research, who uh, stood out for you as being one of the more compelling figures and what, what is their story? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so two, two women come to mind since you sort of mentioned, you know, you sort of uh, suggested that there's a lot of attention to these very great men, right? <laughs> um, and it's frustrating sometimes how little one um, knows about some of the women on the Mayflower. Sometimes one doesn't even know a first name, uh, which can be terribly frustrating. But I'll mention two women that I found uh, really captivating figures from later periods of this his history. One of those is a woman named uh, Anna Stockbridge, uh, who lived in Situate. And in the early 1640s, she had a minister who decided that one could only properly baptize uh, children or others uh, by immersion. So sprinkling wouldn't cut it. You couldn't just sprinkle a little water uh, on an infant. And, you know, the people of Situate really weren't too sure if this was a great idea. You know, you can, if you walked outside today, if you're up in New England, it was probably kind of chilly. Uh, you might not want your, you know, two month old infant, uh, you know, dipped in an icy cold stream. And apparently, according to some sources, some of the ones that Reverend Chauncey dipped got sick and one even died. So there was some opposition. Well, Anna Stockbridge decided she was not going to let her minister uh, baptize uh, her infant. And uh, she uh, took her daughter and went up to Boston and found somebody up in Boston who was willing to do the baptism instead. It's a, it's a small act of resistance, but I just, I really like that. Um, and one can't presume that that request would have been granted. So she must have been very persuasive. Another figure who I found very captivating uh, was um, a Sakana native uh, leader named Awashanks um, in present day Little Compton, uh, Rhode Island, which um, prior to 1740 uh, had been part of Plymouth and then Massachusetts Bay. Awashanks became leader of her community certainly by 1671. And she led uh, her people through an incredibly tumultuous time period. She really was caught between those who wanted um, her to fight the English and those who wanted her to ally with the English. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of rich uh, detailed sources about her uh, in the 1670s, disputes over land uh, sales. And because of what she was up against, it's not an overly happy uh, end to the story. Her people uh, lost pretty much all of their land uh, by the early 1680s. Um, but she was incredibly tenacious. Um, in, it was either 1687 or 1688, uh, one of her sons on her behalf uh, petitioned um, the colonial government for land on which her people could plant their crops. So the mere fact that she maintained leadership of her community for almost two decades amid just remarkable tumult challenges and change, um, I, I find her story uh, very, very noteworthy and a figure who deserves a lot more attention in uh, histories of 17th century New England. Right, sound like two very fascinating characters. <laughs> um, so let's go to Peter has a question. How can we discuss the bondage of Miles Africans in Swansea while being silent about the normalcy of bondage in New England? For the first century, more than uh, half of all European arrivals were bound by various indentures. Indians were likewise enslaved and indentured. Uh, liberty was a strange retrospective conceptualization of the founding. Uh, when for most liberty did not exist at all? Well, it's a good question. I, first of all, I don't, think, I don't think liberty is a strange conceptualization because the word appears so frequently 
uh, in 17th century sources, uh, both in terms of you know, congregational matters, um, either framed as Christian liberty or liberty of the gospel, but also in a discussion of uh, political liberties, namely the right not to be taxed uh, without consent. But, you know, so I think it's, it's a very important uh, concept to trace and discuss. Now, I certainly agree with the thrust of the question that um, the majority of people did not uh, enjoy um, those principles of, of liberty, certainly not in their full uh, expression. And, you know, I, I purposefully started with a few uh, English and Irish examples um, to also encourage us not to think about um, liberty and slavery as simply, you know, two binary outcomes, but that there were these very murky uh, and ambiguous conditions that fell uh, between them. And I think Americans are very much accustomed to think of slavery as African, as inheritable, and as lifelong. Uh, but there were certainly uh, many sorts of um, unfreedom in 17th century New England. And so I think that's, that's certainly a very important thing uh, for uh, historians to, to write about and discuss. So good question. Um, and let's see, this may be our last question of the evening, but um, is there something that you think um, on this 400th anniversary year um, that Americans um, should ponder if they have a chance to think about what this anniversary means? Well, I'm sure there's lots of things Americans should ponder. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess one thing that I ponder, um, and I think is is worth pondering, is you know the when the Pilgrims arrived in 1620, they came to a place that had been thoroughly ravaged by a pandemic of just epic proportions. Uh, you have communities like Patuxet, in which very nearly everybody died. Squanto wasn't quite the only survivor, but very nearly everybody died. Estimates uh, for Wampanoag communities in southeastern Massachusetts, you know, 50 to 90 percent um, death rates. And then the pilgrims, um, you know, they suffer 50 percent losses or so uh, during their first winter. So you have two peoples. Uh, very much uh, afflicted um, by death and misery, uh, who are nevertheless in some ways able to maintain uh, cohesion and develop strategies uh, for surviving and at least on occasion uh, working together uh, in the years ahead, sort of out of, you know, I think perceived mutual uh, self-interest. Um, you know, Americans in 2020, not very good at maintaining cohesion uh, amid and unity, amid um, challenges that are severe, but certainly don't rival those of 1616 to 1620. So I think if we want to take, you know, some inspiration or pondering uh, from uh, the very early history of Plymouth Colony, um, I think that might be a good place to turn. I also think, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of triumphal accounts of the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. And there are also, you know, other accounts that are extremely critical. You know, I prefer accounts that, you know, are simply more uh, gritty and human and try to help us understand um, how both settlers and natives understood the world around them, something that we can really only understand dimly, and you know, help us to better understand the choices that, that they made. Um, you know, that's, that's my preferred approach um, to uh, the study of the past. Great. Well, I think that's a really great place to leave it. Um, thank you so much, John, for this presentation tonight and for your thoughtful answers to all of these questions. Um, 
Uh, if you enjoyed this presentation, we in, uh, encourage you to consider purchasing the book. So um, please purchase from your favorite local bookseller, or you can support one of ours, which is Porter Square Books in Cambridge. Um, and uh, if you're so inclined, I hope you will keep MHS in your thoughts as you prepare your end of year giving. Um, you can check out our membership opportunities at masshist.org support. And thank you very much.